Okie dokie. So this is the first week of suttas that are not from the social and communal harmony book. So we finished that last week and this is a kind of new era of sutta readings and discussions. So the format is basically the same. It's still going to be largely around practical application of these teachings and discussion so that we can all learn from each other. It's not a lecture. It's not an academic class although we might have some of the Pali translations or some alternative translations to refer to from time to time. And I believe Shirley has um, possibly Bhante Sujato's translations there from Sutta Central, possibly. But uh, I'll be reading from Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. So I have the big book, a real life book here, the Samyutta Nikaya. And um, today I want to plunge into the Vedana Samyutta and the reason for that is that Vedana is um, a really foundational practice, Vedana Nusati. In other words, taking Vedana as one of the four Satipatthanas, one of the focuses of our mindfulness, um, means that we're actually coming in direct contact with feelings or experiences, which can be pleasant, painful, or somewhere in between. And these are mostly felt in the body but can be felt at any one of the sense doors or can be caused by contact at any one of the six sense doors, including the mind with its objects. That still produces a kind of feeling, a kind of Vedana, an experience of pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between, sometimes called neutral feelings or sensations. So the word sensations is often used, and especially in the tradition that I um, started my practice with, in the Goenka tradition that goes back to Sayaji Ubakin and uh, his teacher, Sayatetji, and the Lady Sayador. They use the word sensation quite a lot because they did focus on um, feeling the feelings in the body. And that is a very great place to start uh, because there's always some feeling or the other in the body. And uh, one of the difficulties with feelings, if you like, is that they generally have tendencies, underlying tendencies towards greed, hate and delusion. So pleasant feelings, especially worldly pleasant feelings, feelings born of sense contact, have the underlying tendency to greed, to attachment, to clinging, craving, hunger for those things. And then, as you can probably imagine, unpleasant feelings uh, through any of the sense doors, but sensual feelings, worldly feelings, have the underlying tendency to aversion. We don't want to feel them. We don't like them. We develop anger or irritation, even depression, and all sorts of other unwholesome responses to unpleasant feelings. And then those so-called neutral feelings or feelings that are just neither particularly distinctively uh, pleasant or unpleasant. It's hard to find something completely neutral, but something that just doesn't grab us, grab our attention, tends to have the underlying tendency to delusion. We dull out. We just don't notice. And uh, often we react blindly without really knowing what we're reacting to. Yeah, that's because we're not aware of what's happening. It's not, um, we need to develop much stronger mindfulness to be aware of those neutral feelings. So um, I didn't want to get too much into the cause of feelings because we might be able to come to some insights together here about that. And uh, I'd love to hear from your own experience. But just in brief, um, feelings, of course, the ultimate cause of all feelings is birth, you could say. And the cause of birth is delusion. <laughs> we're reborn because of delusion. We don't really know what we're doing. We don't understand things as they are. And therefore, there's craving for existence. And because of that, we have our senses. And because of the senses and the contact uh, between the senses and the objects of those senses, we have feelings. So that direct cause, the most proximate cause for feelings is actually contact, contact to any of the sense doors. And as I said, that includes the mind and its mental objects, you know, whatever we think about or um, imagine or fantasize about. Um, uh, usually memories of the five sense world, <laughs> things we've seen or heard or smelt, et cetera, tasted touches on the body that we reminisce about or that we try to get away from. 
um, thinking about those things are also um, is the mind and its objects. But otherwise, the five senses, for anyone who is not aware, are uh, the eyes. So the eyes are the sense base. And then the object of the eye is form, yeah, visible form. So anything you see. And when those two come in contact, uh, eye consciousness arises and gives rise to feeling based on eye consciousness. So it'll have a certain um, quality of pleasant, unpleasant, or somewhere in between. The same with the nose. It's the organ or the, um, the uh, um, what do you call it? The internal sense base, it's sometimes called, comes in contact with its respective objects, which are usually smells, right? I don't think we can taste with the nose, although they do say taste is partly smell, <laughs> but essentially smells. And then because of that contact between the object and that sense door, um, sense smell consciousness arises, which is, again, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. Ears with sounds. This can be a source of great suffering if we hear sounds that are unpleasant to us, like criticism or blame or just a lot of noise, right? Certain types of birds, you like the sound. Other types of birds, you think it's beautiful. So <laughs> then a pleasant feeling arises. And then uh, taste, another big one. <laughs> we have a lot of opinions about whether tastes are pleasant or unpleasant. And uh, is that it? Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. So this is the one that's always pleasant, right? Right now you can probably feel some kind of contact with your body and the chair you're si sitting on or some kind of feeling that's created inside the body by movement that's happening, maybe food moving around your intestines or um, other diseases that you might have. So um, there's a tangible feeling there and that can be pleasant, unpleasant or somewhere in between. And if you're anything like me today, it's mostly unpleasant. <laughs> you know, people with chronic conditions experience a lot of pain. And I think this increases generally. Um, as we age, generally, generally, it's not going to get a lot easier. So we really need to learn how to regard these in wholesome ways. So with that little introduction to feeling, and I'm not going to go into this as an academic would, um, but hopefully that's enough to, to, um, to describe what we're going to talk about. I would like to go to Vedana Samyutta number 12. So for anyone who's new to Sutta study, I'll write it in the box, but the usual way we abbreviate these suttas is like Samyutta Nikaya is like SN, and then Vedana Samyutta is a chapter, and it's chapter 36, so we write 36, and then uh, a colon, and then the exact verse or the exact sutta in that chapter. So this is number 12, and it's called The Sky. Here we go. So that's how we um, abbreviate. And as I said, it's this big book, which actually I think, although it's quite deep and quite um, perhaps in places difficult to understand, it's very technical, it's very practiced oriented. I think it's a great place to start in the suttas um, because it is themed and there's a beautiful introduction to each chapter by Bhikkhu Bodhi. So. But I like this one because it's very easy to understand and refers to uh, feelings as an aspect of nature. So I'll start to read it now. Or do you want to read it, Venable? I have read this. Okay, I'll read really this really one. And then maybe we'll compare. All right. So where it says bhikkhus, I'm going to say monastics, okay, to be inclusive. And uh, to be more inclusive from time to time, I'll say community. All right. <clears throat> But this is addressing the monastic community. Probably lay people were there too. Monastics. Just as various winds blow in the sky. Winds from the east. Winds from the west. Winds from the north. Winds from the south. Dusty winds and dustless winds. Cold winds and hot winds. Mild winds and strong winds. So too, various feelings arise in this body. 
pleasant feeling arises, painful feeling arises, neither painful nor pleasant feeling arises. And then there's a little poem. Just as many diverse winds blow back and forth across the sky, easterly winds and westerly winds, northerly winds and southerly winds, dusty winds and dustless winds, sometimes cold, sometimes hot. Those that are strong and others mild, many kind, many winds of many kinds that blow. So in this very body here, various kinds of feelings arise, pleasant ones and painful ones, and those neither painful nor pleasant. But when a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni or anybody, any practitioner who is ardent, does not neglect clear comprehension, then that wise person fully understands feelings in their entirety. Having fully understood feelings, they are taintless in this very life, standing in the Dhamma with the body's breakup. The knowledge master cannot be reckoned. Mm. <laughs> the last bit's a little bit cryptic, perhaps, but it'd be nice to just have a look at this, perhaps from the beginning. And um, of course, invite any comments, questions, reflections from the group at any time. So you're very, very welcome to write in the chat box if you wish, or if you prefer, you can raise your hand and. Um, I might not come to you straight away, but I'll come to you at some opportune time and we can have some discussion around it. So um, the first thing that stands out to me when we're talking about, uh, you know, using this analogy of winds blowing in the sky is that the Buddha often uses aspects of nature to describe what happens, you know, in this body and mind. And I think there's a meaning to this in that nature is something that's very impersonal and something that is um, not easy to control. In fact, it's beyond our control, right? Things arise due to causes, but they don't arise in relation to any being. <laughs> they just arise. It's, it's an aspect of nature. And of course, all of us are just nature mm -hmm. itself. Sometimes we say, oh, you know, we're no different, we're, no se we're not separate from nature, or we, we're an aspect of nature, but it, we actually are nature. And I think the Indigenous Australians understood this very well. They made no distinction you know, between nature and between themselves. So um, the next part of this is the three types that I described before. So the pleasant feeling that arises, painful feeling arises, and neither painful nor pleasant feeling arises. And it's talking about the body. It's saying that these various feelings arise in this body. So the significance of this is that it's something that can be experienced right now and at any time, right? Vedana is a tangible experience that's uh, happening now. It's always happening now. You know, our thoughts about Vedana are not actually Vedana. They're just conjecture. And they're just memorizing or remembering the past or uh, projecting into the future. But Vedana itself has this ability to bring us right into the present moment if we can be aware. So, um, yeah, Shirley says, it makes me think of the worldly winds, especially pleasure and pain, which is already interesting because that's getting into our reactivity, isn't it? You know, the fact that... Um, Worldly winds in the in the Buddha's teachings are things like uh, praise, praise and blame, um, pleasure and pain is one of them, yeah. And what are the other ones? Fame and disrepute, gain and loss, isn't it? Yeah. So there's eight worldly winds, and pleasure and pain are two of them. So that's quite interesting because uh, you know they can pull us around. This is the thing; they can pull us around. You know, we get elated when there's a pleasant feeling and then as soon as it fades, we start to get bored and then, you know, it can actually change quite quickly into um, a very unpleasant feeling and affect our mood. Um, and yet it doesn't always have to. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
It's not always connected to that. There's also a comment saying different types of winds pass by. They're impermanent like the Vedana, <clears throat> the way I like to think, to link it to Vedana. Yeah, that's the other aspect here. I mean, the three are very similar. There's impermanence, non-self and suffering, right? And the three are all aspects of one and the same. Anything that's uh, non-self is non-self precisely because it's impermanent. If something's impermanent, it cannot be a self. Right. So, um, and because of that, it's suffering. We want to hold on to things. We want to own things, especially the pleasant stuff. We want to own the unpleasant too, in the sense we can tell it when to leave. <laughs> okay, I've had enough of you. You're mine. You should stop. It should be up to me whether I experience you or not. Right. So, yeah, I think that's another beautiful um, aspect of this. Mm. And that they just arise. Right. They arise due to causes, easterly, westerly, northern, northerly and southerly winds, mm. changing all the time. Some are strong and others are mild, right? Some sensations or feelings in the body are quite mild. Maybe we don't even really notice them and perhaps we're having reactions to them anyway and we're just not aware of those reactions but some are very obvious aren't they and easily give rise to reactivity and yet at the same time when they're obvious it can be um, possible to work with them and to see our tendencies to greed or to um, aversion Richard uh, yes hi Venables um, well, that's a, it's about um, two weekends ago I was, I was, uh, so about this, I tend to settle, not have a um, I tend to settle, said, excuse me. You know, so about two weekends ago, mm -hmm. I was with, um, I was with, um, I was with, um, Ajahn Suchita on a weekend retreat in London. And actually, he was such a, you know, he was actually talking about this very subject, yeah. the whole weekend retreat. Mm -hmm. And part of the, part of the retreat was, and um, we actually doing sort of Qigong, you know, Qigong. Yeah, and also part of its retreat was also doing walking, which doing walking. So half of the group, there's 90, 90 of us. So half of us were split up into walking, and the other half of us were split up to lying down, mm. which was very entertaining because mm. one guy fell asleep, <laughs> snore very loudly. But the whole point of the of the retreat is actually to engage with how the body, you know, and how, you know, how we're actually feeling, yeah. you know, and how all the feelings coming up and, you know, how we relate to the feeling in the body itself and how it actually manifests in the body and um, how, you know, how we're feeling. And it wasn't so much an intellectual... Um, Absolutely. It was more to do with actually how it felt you know, Absolutely. And then sort of see how it manifested in the body. Yeah, and it was actually very good. It's very good, actually. Mm. So I thought yeah. that was very nice. So, that's great. Yeah, that's know. why Ajahn Brahm's favorite translation, actually, and I think it's a valid translation for Vedana, is experience, yeah. not just feeling. You know, because the word Veda, Vedati, the verb that it comes from, does mean to experience. Yeah, so well, that's really absolutely wonderful. right. It's not an intellectual understanding at all. That would be more like um, a sort of proliferation that arises after we've felt something. And often we don't even know that it's a response to the feeling. But the actual yeah, so, feeling itself is an experience. It has to be understood yeah, so, through direct experience. Yeah, so I actually found it quite helpful for myself as well, yeah. obviously, you know, for everybody else on the retreat as well, obviously, you know, it's not just me. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I found it quite helpful. Good, good. Well, I did, to be honest, I did find it a bit confusing at first because I most, you know, um, first day, but then I understood what he was trying to teach, mm. you know, so um, mm -hmm. I sort of clicked on yeah. and it made more sense when I tried not to think about it so much, but to <laughs> actually just yeah. relax. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah, could you put the light on, please? 
Yeah, thanks for that, Richard. And I think, you know, in the next little paragraph, it does actually talk about, um, you know, having this, um, it says when a person or a monastic, in this case, is ardent, does not neglect clear comprehension, then that wise person fully understands feelings in their entirety. And this is the clue, isn't it, that it's something that we have to actually be aware of right normally in this little paragraph this is very similar to the one that's found in the satipatthana um uh sutta normally it says mindful ardent mindful and clear comprehension um but in this case it's just saying ardent and with clear comprehension and it's focusing on the understanding of those feelings as well so um yeah that can only be done by direct experience. And the first uh, part of learning to uh, experience feelings is establishing mindfulness of feelings, right? We have to actually direct our mind towards the felt experience again and again and again. In the same way that we, when we work with breath meditation, we have to kind of keep on, in, in a sense, recalling the object or bringing the object to mind, you know, um, the same for Vedana. We have to actually have this continuity of awareness, which is one of my favorite um, interpretations of the word ardent. You know, ardent can sound a bit like, right, we've got to really go for it. We've got to kind of, uh, you know, kind of work really, really hard. But I really like this idea of continuity and gentle persistence. Yeah, just persistently and continuously uh, making that effort or remembering, if you like, to be aware of the feelings. And even as I talk about feelings, this starts to happen because it was such um, a foundational practice for me for the first 14 years of my life, at least. Um, so, yeah, it has to be experienced. And that's one of the beauties of that practice. It is a direct experience. I'll just come to the chat because there's quite a lot in there. Um, interesting, we can feel gain and loss in our bodies as well. Many teachers advise staying with the bodily feelings. We are less likely to be swept away. Yeah. Yeah, we can feel gain and loss in our bodies. Can you explain that a bit more? Like, how does it feel? Where's that person? Can you unmute? Uh, there's a sort of there's a sort of either a saggy feeling or a sort of anguish in the sort of feeling anguish in the heart. Um, I can't put it in a bodily way. I know I'm putting sort right. of conditions on it, but there's a feeling in the heart or the belly when you lose something or a sort of fear, and you sort of just feel it in the body. But when you get something, there's oh, you know, this sort of Oh, feeling sort of running up your front. That's what happens to me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, an excitement, but it's a sort of, it's in the body as well as in the mind. Yeah. And I do think, I mean, I don't do this very well, but I do think that if you, if you, I mean, I tend not to do it with gain, sometimes with, you know, with deep sadness, um, you know, if something really horrible has happened possibly not loss, um, but to actually feel it in the body can be very grounding. And then the mind doesn't run away with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you first, in a sense, you're saying, I guess, that sometimes we can practice in, in a way that we're aware of an emotion first, and then we go to the feeling that can be um, perhaps feeding that emotion. Well, yes. I mean, there's a feeling of, with gain and loss, there's a, there's a mental, it's a mental feeling, but it's mm. also reflected in the body as well. Right, right, right. Absolutely. I think that's what the teachers are saying, and I think Ajahn Suchito is probably saying that in, um, in Richard's retreat very much about, you know, because he does a lot of body work and a lot of going to the body. Right. And a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers advise, you know, just feel it in the body, go to the body, yeah, because yeah. then it's very grounding and you're actually mind, more mindful because the body right. the body actually doesn't run away, does it? The mind, I suppose that's why. Yeah, that's but right. the mind can run all, all over the place, at least mind can. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, certainly there's a validity to doing it that way. I mean, my practice was more being in the body all the time so that actually the way these come up is already changed because they're less likely to actually come up as, say, excitement or, you know, the emotional aspect is less likely to come up. So, I mean, my main practice was to um, establish such a strong and continuous awareness of feelings in the body and their impermanent nature that, you know, when things would happen that were difficult or that would perhaps have a tendency to lead towards sadness or despair, they didn't have that chance Mm -hmm. because I was aware of the uh, feelings and because of that awareness, the mind didn't have time in a sense to react. And especially when you feel the feelings just constantly changing, they actually cease to be pleasant or unpleasant. The main quality that I would notice is their impermanent nature. It's very inspiring, very well practiced, uh, venerable. I think it's the power of that method. Yes. The power of a method that sort of um, encourages that continuity of awareness of the yeah. sensations. But yeah. somebody today asked me just now at tea time, um, have I noticed that the quality of feelings that I experience or the quality of sensations, for example, if it's bodily, um, have I noticed it change from the so-called Vedana Nupassana, let's say, which some people call Vipassana, uh, and Samatha practice? And that's a really interesting question because I actually do think that the type of feelings I experience have changed somewhat and my relationship to them has changed too. So there's actually, in a sense, less of the continuity of equanimity that arises through seeing impermanence and probably more variety of emotions. There's like more room, in a way, for me to work with emotions it's and interesting. also yeah. cultivate the the pleasant feelings that are spiritual, unworldly pleasant feelings. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because Ajahn Samay, Ajahn Brahm often talks about getting out, getting into the mind rather than the body. And I mean, that's a whole yes. different. That's a whole different topic. I don't think we can sort of get into dis- get into discussing this. So I'll do that for now. But I wanted to talk about Vedana. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to come to Suzanne and then come back to the chat, so we don't uh, overlook your wonderful comments in the chat box, Suzanne. And if anyone from the chat would like to speak instead, please feel free. Hi, Suzanne. Hello. Thank you. Um, I just found this um, a point that you were talking about um, Vedana and uh, and Samatha practice and how feelings are uh, it's a different a little different approach to them and as you were talking about the equanimity you know um, uh, being with the feelings and just see how they arise and 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 disappear and and uh, I was kind of thinking well. Um, because my in my practice is, is is being being with the feeling and and really letting the feeling uh, just be almost be the feeling and it, it, to me it's the ent- the uh, entrance to jhanas you know to go into this deeper you know to d- disappear into them almost you know and I'm wondering you know because it is 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 a different kind of approach. You know, watching the feelings and not being involved. Yeah. And, you know, really just um, uh, uh, diving into into it, you know, without mm-hmm. anything with it. So, right, right. Yeah. I, I sort of know where you're coming from. I mean, without uh, maybe getting into what is or isn't a jhana, because that's another topic further. Yeah. But I think, yeah, there's a difference in our... Um, how close we get. I was talking about this today. Was it with you or Lena? I think that one of my teachers, Bante Ojagara, he has these lovely charts that he's made and they're about the gradual training. So they show all the different sort of practices, including sense restraint. Um, and Sila, I think, is on there, but also so called Vipassana. And I say so called because it's not really, the Buddha doesn't use that term as a method, but in terms of like things we think of as Vipassana methods. Um, so there's the Vipassana or the, yeah, there's a Vipassana approach, which is more geared towards insight. And then there's Samadhi, right? Samatha, the process of quietening and Samadhi itself. 
unification of the mind. And he has this lovely um, sort of diagram that shows those different practices as different distances we have from the object of meditation. So in, say, sense restraint, the object can be here, say it's a sound, and the mind is over here, right? So when we're walking around during the day, our mind is here, there's a sound, it's, it's over here, it's coming in from the outside, and there's quite a, a big gap between us and the sound where we can, you know, mm-hmm. have a wholesome or an unwholesome relationship with it. So it's quite a big area there. We're not really in the sound. It's something outside. And then the next is like Vipassana, which is where the mind's very close to the object, but not completely absorbed into it. It's just very close. Mm -hmm. So it's with it and it's quite continuously with it, but it's also able to discern and to analyze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can kind of look, you can almost move around. I actually prefer it sort of as a circle, but you can kind of move around it. And then Samatha is when it's actually unified. it's, inside yeah. if you like it's you know the object and the mind have unified so there's no separation there their insight can't arise but then after the samadhi you know you come away again and again you can see what's going on mm-hmm. and yeah. that discernment that wisdom can arise so yeah it is a bit different it is a bit different plus i think for the samadhi practice we're deliberately um allowing let's say and putting causes in place for uh, wholesome pleasure to arise, wholesome happiness to arise. Whereas in Vipassana, we really aren't concerned with the type of feeling that's arising. We're concerned with understanding its nature. Mm-hmm. So there's a big difference there. You know, I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of wholesome happiness in my Vipassana practice, but that wasn't my, that wasn't the aspect of experience I was looking at. I was looking at the aspect of impermanence. That was the main object. Mm -hmm. and you know the nature of the feeling you know when when this happens you are you know there's no nobody there who's experiencing the feeling is is just whatever you call this so and it disappears everything disappears so what is the nature of the feeling i mean if you watch it it's going to be there if you if you're if you're it then it disappears so what is the nature of the right right exactly yeah 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 good good <laughs> yeah, question mark <laughs> yes 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 absolutely i'm really wondering this you know like so is the world there or not you know when i when i go into this meditation and everything disappears then and, mm. and then i come back and it's there again so is it there or not you right. know that's right. something right, that's right. On my mind yeah right now. yeah good great line of investigation Okay, and I think it's better not to study too much around it because it has to be your insight. Mm-hmm. Mm. But I think you're touching on that point where you're touching on the conditioned nature of experience. In other words, experience arises due to contact between a sense and its object. If there's no contact, there's no feeling. Yeah, it's conditioned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Can I come to Jeff? Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I think you're unmuted. I'm unmuted. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Just as you were talking, it, I read this uh, book ages ago on insight meditation, um, and it's by Ajahn Sobin Nonto. Um, practical steps to ultimate truth okay the reason i found it really helpful was in many different ways essentially the book was talking about observing where uh, the the mind um between what was happening outside and 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 this and when we sensed it and and so many different metaphors and explanations were used but the I think the essence of the teaching of that book was to was to keep observing uh, the connection between all of these senses and and and, and our internal experience, mm. and, then, and then ultimately, um, in in observing, almost naturally, it happens that um, there's a sort of falling away, but um, there's an increasing um, gap between. Um, what is what is sensed and, and what's what's up between the sensor and 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 what is sensed outside, mm-hmm. and it, it didn't use this 
this particular metaphor, but the one that came to mind for me was was a little bit like, a, and I'm not a mechanic, but at all, but a, an engine um, with a clutch, and when the, when the clutch disengages um, the wheels from the engine, um, then it's you know there is a there is a, a freedom then a, 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 you know and um, and, and no connection. Uh, so a space, a, a space emerges. So, yeah, insight meditation by by Namto, I, I find really yeah. helpful. But lots of practical steps about uh, about how to go through that process of of insight meditation. I haven't explained it very well because it's a while yeah. since, I've, but it it was a really helpful text. I mm. remember. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I'm just going to come to your comment in the chat as well to. Um, continue maybe i shouldn't unmute you you might want to speak more about that but you also said this is a very reassuring message and you're talking about the sutta again the last uh paragraph uh for how to respond to bodily changes and maturing and the uh paragraph is having fully understood feelings one is taintless in this very life standing in the dhamma with the body's break up the knowledge master cannot be reckoned <laughs> I, 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 that's that's just really beautiful. I mean, it is, is reassurance, and it's a it's a guide as to what to do. Standing in the dhamma with the with the body's breakup, which we mm. all have at different times as as we as we mature, and that's this is really um, also very beautiful. The knowledge master cannot be reckoned. So mm. you know, there is, it, it's you know, it's a very steadfast uh, approach yeah. uh, really really nice verse yeah 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 thank you for pointing that out very encouraging yeah, yeah. i'm gonna come to christine because her comment's been there a while and then i'll come to you sunma uh where's sunma gone next week probably. oh there she is yeah good i'm coming to you very soon so is this the way is the way we react to feelings carried on from life to life? For example, if I notice that I tend to want to run away, repress or deny unpleasant feelings, and I find it difficult to stay with them, then it shows me where I need to practice more mindfulness. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think these tendencies are, of course, carried on until we fully understand feeling, right? Until we actually are... Um, I guess with the reactivity to pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, I mean that won't be fully overcome until we're anagamis because they still are have tendencies to greed and aversion. I mean, stream winners still have greed and aversion, right? So they're still reacting to something, which is ba and the feeling will be part of that. Um, so of course, these tendencies are there. And of course, the the more we react to something in a certain way, the more likely it is we're kind of conditioning our mind to always react that way. But this is where the Dhamma comes in and has incredibly powerful transformative effects. And, um, you know, I think one moment of mindfulness tends to break through quite a lot of conditioning if we continue. I mean, we have to practice regularly. It's that regularity that's really important. But I do think... Um, you know, if you notice a particular tendency to run away from certain kinds of feeling, that's certainly um, a clue as to where to build mindfulness. Absolutely. Um, but to build it kindly, to build it kindly, not to think, well, I always try and run away or repress or deny this unpleasant feeling. I should stay with it at any cost. You know, I should kind of sit through pain. I should sit through depression no matter what. And just by being aware, that will be enough. That usually doesn't work simply because there's not enough um, wisdom involved. And for that reason, you know, Ajahn Brahm often teaches that mindfulness needs to be joined with kindness. That's just a kind of simple way of saying the three right intentions are necessary too. So the attitude you have towards what's arising, which can be ideally needs to be one of loving kindness, one of um, uh, not possessing, not identifying too much with that feeling and um, compassion, essentially compassion. So I would say, Yes, it might be pointing to a place that you can, you know, slowly turn toward, but do so gently. That's why I like this translation 
my own imagine, my own creation really of um, ardent as gentle persistence or gentle continuity, gentle turning towards, if you like. Uh, so, uh, Sunma, do you wish to share what you want to share? So it's just reminding me of um, in sitting with the senses, it seems it's very important to do that and let them come and go. Because eventually you, you really just want to withdraw and be with the breath. That's That's what seems to happen to me yeah yeah um and but you if you just i've done a lot of different methods mm -hmm. so if you if you just go straight away to uh focusing on the breath uh it's it's, it's sort of like you're saying you know you, you'll get more rigid with yourself and come back to the breath come back to the breath mm -hmm. but i find if i'm uh just letting the senses flow and go and not reject them or avoid them, but just uh, some, also sometimes uh, a verse comes up from Satipatthana, which is uh, here the, um, if I remember it, sorry, I, I was just time. thinking of it, but I might lose I it. Know. I might lose it, but I'll try to do my own words. What, what, uh, it just comes about that uh, here um, craving is established, here craving is bent, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but sometimes uh, I just let them flow. I, I don't uh, add, add anything. I think it's better to not add anything. But yes. <laughs> The thoughts uh, have in storage when you practice something a lot over years, which was uh, Satipatthana, along with Tibetan uh, Buddhism, called mm. preliminary practice. Uh, yeah, so I, I was more more drawn to Satipatthana. However, mm. I finished my practice. It took right. about fifteen years. Uh, something that should be done in six months if yeah. you're inside, but I've never been inside. So <laughs> anyway, uh, only on my body. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's all the thoughts that were arising. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's so interesting because I am. Um, I'm interested. Maybe, maybe like you kind of started with the Vipassana more than anything else. I did a little bit of breath meditation, but it was kind of like, oh, the mind's wandered, bring it back. The mind's wandered, bring it back. And it was a drag. It was actually dragging meditation, dragging it, dragging it. <laughs> and then when I go to the Vedanana Pasana, like the Satipatthana practice with taking feelings in the body as my main object, my mind would engage like anything. It was so fascinating, so interesting. So in my mind, I had this idea that, you know, Anapana was the preliminary practice that you just sort of got over with quickly, especially if you were kind of good at the observing feelings. And then you went on to the higher practice of, you know, observing feelings. But actually, as my practice changed over time, I realized that the Satipatthana is actually an incredible foundation for breath meditation proper because breath meditation is really subtle and it's about bringing the mind to much subtler states. And um, I think a good foundation in you know working with feelings is really helpful um, to learn to work with the hindrances and overcome those tendencies to greed and aversion and also you know the kind of dull, deluded states of mind. Yeah, but one of the things I did find tricky changing to breath primarily to the breath was um, that the perception of impermanence had become so continuous and so strong that even the breath would just appear like vibrations that couldn't keep it there. It would just dissolve. It, it wouldn't really be a mm -hmm. kind of stable object for calming the mind. So the two practices seemed almost the same. So I realized then that you can get kind of... Um, if you're always doing one method, you, your perception can get kind of conditioned so strongly that it's then hard to look at an object in a different way. 
That was quite interesting for me. Yeah. I don't know if that makes at all any sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll come to Benjamin, then I'll come to the chat again. So I don't leave the chat folks out. Hi, Benjamin. Can you unmute? Yes, I think I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, I'm trying to puzzle something out about what still qualifies as Vedana in a sense. Yeah. So the way it's set out here seems uh, on at first glance to be very much about the physical senses. Um, but you mentioned also that you can have Vedana that are from the sixth mind sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, coming from a, a perspective where a lot of my practice has been in Taoist traditions as well as Buddhism, I've worked a lot with something that you might categorize as being an intermediary between body and mind. Yeah. It's subtle energies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they body, are they mind, or are they a third category? It's kind of hard to say. Mm. And I'm wondering if if feelings on that level of experience work the same way as physical mm. and if they're worked with in the same way. Right. Or to look at it from another angle, which might make it a bit clearer. Any mental experience, like any thought, any emotion, anything like that, if you look carefully, there's a subtle movement of the mind that precedes it. Mm. There's something that gives rise to a thought. Yes. Is that subtle movement Vedana? Hmm. I would say that subtle movement is Sankara. I would say. I, I, I think I know what you mean. You know, when you sort of, the mindfulness is really strong and maybe the mind's quite silent and then there's the, a sort of bubbling up. There's a kind of almost a habitual energy that arises that wants to form into a thought. And if your mindfulness is really strong, it kind of just bubbles down again. <laughs> it just kind of goes bloop <laughs> and it doesn't sort of lead to a thought. But what I could sense when this happens is there's a certain it does seem to carry with it either craving or aversion. There's a certain motivational energy behind it that I can catch. So I think because, you know, if you're very much in touch with the Vedana and you're undermining that reactivity, that's one of the reasons it just bubbles down again. It just disappears. It doesn't really form into a thought. But the question of energy and feelings is an interesting one. I remember now that when Ajahn Chito, I have been on a few of his retreats, and I like the fact that he teaches a very embodied practice. Um, and he did make a distinction between feelings, between energy, and also between emotions. There's definitely a difference between feeling and emotion. Emotion is not included in Vedana. Emotion is more a response to the Vedana. It's the proliferation that uh, follows in a way. Energy, I would say it's probably a subtler type of Vedana, honestly. Um, yeah. But I think, I mean, it's important to realize that Vedana is not physical, mm -hmm. but Vedana is actually a mental component. It's an aspect of the mind. So in the five khandas, we have Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vijnana, which means uh, body or form, physical form, material form. Um, Vedana, feeling or experience, perception, um, mental volition, let's say, or volitional activity, which includes will, choices, reactivity, and consciousness. And it's those four, the feeling, perception, uh, reactivity or volition, and consciousness, they're mental aggregates. It's just that they can be felt in the body very easily. And there are feelings related to mental thoughts. I mean, whenever we have a thought, there's a certain, you know, pleasure or unpleasantness or somewhere in between quality to it, right? Which is one of the aspects of Vedana. Um, and it will have a corresponding physical feeling, but it could be very subtle. Yeah. So, I mean, some people describe Vedana as the hedonic tone of experience. 
you know, they describe it as the quality of pleasure, pain, or somewhere in between. But it's easier to feel in the body. That's what I've noticed. You can sometimes relate the feelings in the body to sense contact. For example, if you're sitting meditating and everything's silent and then it starts to rain on the roof of the Dhamma Hall and you feel it like going through the body, you feel this kind of, the vibrations get stronger and it's like, it's almost like raining through you. And it's clearly caused by the contact at the ear sense door. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to come to uh, the chat. Do you want to answer some stuff? I'm taking over completely. Do you want to read this one? Manori? Do you want to read oh, this Jatha. Yeah. I, uh, I chance Jatha translates, but when a mendicant, med- medication, mendicant <laughs> is keen, not neglecting situational awareness, <laughs> that astute person understands all feeling. Mm. So... Ajahn Sujato, Pantha Sujato translates um, uh, atapi uh, as, keen. as keen, what you were translating as continuous yeah. uh, awareness, but he translates as, as keen and he uh, translates sampajanya as situational awareness. That's one of his, yeah. his pet points that the point about Sampajanya is that you know what is appropriate at that time. Yeah. One of his favorite stories <laughs> is when he came out of his first retreat in um, Thailand. He was a young monk and it was a Mahasi retreat. So he was had learned how to, you know, lifting, moving, placing, lifting, moving, placing. He came out of the retreat and he was extremely mindful lifting moving placing and it was a it was a new center so it was a building site and it was a complete mess and he lifting moving placed over a nail (laughs) (laughs) so situational awareness is knowing to be aware of your not only your you know what you're doing at the right time and if you're in a building site watch out for nails watch out uh, as opposed to being so perfectly mm-hmm. mindful so uh yeah situational awareness is uh his translation of sampajanya mm. knowing what what is required of your mind at that time not just kind of a blank this is my technique i am watching my lifting moving placing wherever i go um Yes, and that astute person understands all feelings. Hmm. I have one to comment on this word situational awareness because I find that very reductionist of Sampajanya because actually Sampajanya has four aspects. One of them is contextual or situational Hmm. awareness, but there's also the aspect of um, with wisdom, asamoha Sampajanya. Like in the commentaries, there's four things. One is the mm-hmm. domain or the field. I can't remember all of them. I always forget all of them, but there were four. Mm-hmm. And one, sorry. The intention. Mm-hmm. What you're doing. The, yeah. the purpose. The, the, knowing the purpose. That's right. Knowing the, the context, which is the situational side. So knowing, yeah, knowing the purpose, knowing the context or the situation. Um, there's another one. Knowing the field. Domain. The domain. And yeah, the domain. And knowing the um and and knowing with wisdom. Asamoha Sampajanya, knowing with wisdom. So that actually means knowing that it's arising and passing. So I feel that translating it as situational awareness is really limited. Personally. Personally, I feel he's bringing out one aspect and neglecting the others. Whereas when you say clear comprehension, it can still be open to all of those interpretations. Sorry? <laughs> that's true. He wasn't guarding his uncle. But anyway, that's my particular um, issue. Domain. What is domain? I think 
it's it, knowing the field of the senses, I guess, like knowing where to be aware, what to be aware of, like knowing the field, knowing the terrain, if you like. It just meant like for a monk, you know, your terrain is not in an, is, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Not wandering into nightclub areas or, oh, you know, okay. that's a very gross example, mm-hmm. but. The sat the 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 force satipatthanas is your domain. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's go to the next chat because this is kind of techy when we get into translations. I don't know how many people enjoy that and how many people find that quibbly. <laughs> um, so I'll just go to the chat and then come to Liz. These days, I'm learning to have an embodied awareness of the body. <laughs> while being aware of feelings, mind, hindrances, etc. Great. Exactly. Because the thing is, you can actually have sustained awareness of the body because there's always some feeling going on in there. And then, of course, as a result of that, we start to see the mind, how it's behaving. We start to see the hindrances, how they're behaving, but we don't get swept away. We're still embodied. We're still grounded. And in a way, we're closer to the actual direct experience of these things, which is, you know, the precursor to tanha, because it's from the contact that the feeling arises, and then from the feeling that the craving arises. So by the if you're only aware of the craving, in other words, the hindrances or whatever, you've missed the cause. You've missed the cause. Uh, it's kind of too late by then. I mean, you can apply remedies. But if you're actually with the uh, feelings, and even more than that, with the contact, You know, actually seeing how these feelings arise due to the contact. That's another level of depth in the observation. Um, Then it's likely the hindrances won't even arise. Or you'll see them very, very early on. It's like stopping the train before it gets too fast. You know, when it's just left the station, you can still stop it. But once it's going really, really fast, it's hard to stop. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, last weekend or whenever it was that I taught this day retreat on Vedana, it was actually specific to those links in dependent origination. So it was called Between Sensing and Craving Vedana, how it works in the Paticca Samapada. I also realized this is one way of working with feelings. Like one way is to establish this awareness and equanimity and an understanding that it's changing, some understanding of the causality, maybe some understanding of whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. But another way is to actually cultivate wholesome feelings, like cultivate what's called the niramisa feelings. So we're not only focusing on undermining craving, but we're also focusing on developing wholesome states and more beautiful sources of pleasure that are still related to feelings, but wholesome feelings. So, for example, the piti, the sukha, pasadi, um, serenity, stillness. These are inspiration, even confidence in the Dhamma. These are all pleasant feelings, but they're not leading to craving. And as such, they don't form part of dependent origination. They're distinct from the feeling that's discussed in dependent origination. So that's more, again, in line with the Samatha practice in a way. But I think some ability to work with, you know, the kind of feelings that lead to unwholesome states is really essential to practice. If we're just depending on having, you know, pure pleasure of the mind, (laughs) then we might actually be bypassing some of the more difficult things. And you can maintain your equanimity when things are going well. But what about when you do face maybe, you know, severe, deathly suffering? As they say in the suttas, you know, and even in the suttas, there was a monk who um, was on his deathbed and he said uh, to the Buddha, oh, no, oh, no, this is terrible. My samadhi is falling away. I'm not getting into these peaceful states anymore. And the Buddha said, is that your practice? Is, Is that the extent of it? You know, this is not the point. Look at your candors. Is feeling you? Is form you? Is it yours? You know, is there anything in there that's you? Are you in the feeling? Are you in the form? And he got him to analyze this whole thing. So we do need that wisdom faculty as well. Uh, okay, one more chat and then we'll come to Liz. I just started to understand that feelings are something that can be seen. They are usually so mind and time consuming but to start to see them was like fresh water on the face 
Mm, yeah, I think by see you mean brought to mind like pasadi or vipassana. Yeah, we see them clearly. Yeah, isn't that great? Isn't that great? Because it is just Vedana. And in the Satipatthana Sutta, it actually says, you know, we're practicing to come to this place where, uh, mm, how is it? Yavadeva, Jnana Mataya, Patisati Mataya. We basically just see feelings as feelings without clinging to anything in the world. Anisito Chavihadati. Yeah, without clinging to anything in the world. We just see feelings as feelings. It's not my feeling. It's not you know, this type of feeling or that type of feeling even, it's just feeling. That's all it is. It's not me, not mine, not a self. Yeah. It's a relief, isn't it? Okay, there's just time to come to Liz. We've got like four more minutes. <laughs> Sorry to squeeze you in at the end. I, you must be a mind reader because I was thinking, me, I, I am, well, maybe it's not the right way, but I focus on the contact because that is where I feel the secret is for mm -hmm. me anyway. And uh, for example, you were speaking about meditation and having a noise. Uh, now, I love science, so you, you'll see how I make the link. If I hear a noise, before it used to annoy me and I used to really feel my body get all screwed up, but now I feel that's a vibration of the air. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And the, the feeling just goes, I, I don't pursue it. I don't pursue the heat. Yes, it is hot. And I, I'm not very good with heat. Or um, taste. Yeah, it's just a reaction of what's mm -hmm. in my mouth with my receptors on my tongue. Right. And that has cooled down the feeling. Mm -hmm. I think... Well, for me, I'm not, uh, but th that focusing on the contact is for me the key to quietening down the feelings so right. that you have the time not to to get your knickers in a twist. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I feel it, it, I've been doing that for years. And um, mm -hmm. yes, I think you feel freer. You, you don't respond as much where I get stuck now that is really is the feeling of an idea you know when an idea comes and that's why I've been feeling flat all day because something a memory came a memory which I found very upsetting now the upset is gone but the body is saying Oh, I don't really fancy going for a walk. Oh, I, it, it, the mm. body hasn't quite recovered because yes, that's yes. something which has really upset me terribly. Mm -mm. Mm. But otherwise, go for the contact. As far as I am concerned, you know, go for the contact phase. That's where, for me, the, the key is to... Right. Yeah. That's so lovely. Thank you for that. That's really um, wonderful. And I, I just noted down a couple of the words and phrases you used because it was so beautiful that that, you know, staying at that contact is a kind of um, causes a cooling down or a quietening down of the feelings. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're seeing it because in nature. I, you, you nip it in the bud before it yeah. actually builds up. Yeah. Even in the feeling, yeah. because you see the contact. Yeah. And now, now, as I say, I love science, and so I've been following science. So for me, quantum physics is very helpful. I see something which, and I think, yeah, you know, really, that's fresh air. There is hardly anything in that. And, and I, I pass on, and the feeling hasn't come because I can see behind it which my brother nicknamed me the, the nightmare of the shopkeepers because I don't buy things because I, I see there is contact and I say, yeah, you know, really, uh, if that was reduced to, to the matter, there is actually no matter at all in that. So I will pass, you know. And uh, that reminds me uh, when the Buddha said, uh, you know, to watch at the door of the senses. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th that exactly. is where, uh, in fact, he's aiming for. It, it is a contact. 
uh, and if you can actually see the contact between what and what, there is no contact. There is just built by the mind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a really great note to end on. And um, yeah, it leads me to sort of answering one of the questions in the chat. Now, I don't want to limit these uh, sort of discussions to a particular text. I don't want to say we'll do Samyutta Nikaya or we'll do Majjhima Nikaya or we'll do Vedana or we'll do this or that because I really want it to be something that I'm practicing with, something that I am uh, find meaningful and I guess a variety of suttas, you know, including uh, some of the so-called cardinal suttas like the Anattalakana and the Dhammachaka Sutta. But uh, I thought today because it's the first and because we haven't kind of figured out um, a big sutta that we want to cover, which will take many sessions, I thought we'll do one that we'll easily finish in one session. So um, I'm not sure to answer uh, one of the questions about uh, will we be doing suttas from the Samyutta Nikaya? But I am wondering, based on the last comment, whether it might be nice to look at something from the Salayatana Sutta, Samyutta, next week, which is about the senses since that is, uh, you know, the cause of Vedana arising. So I don't know. Does that sound interesting? We could do something from the Salayatana Samyutta, which is number 35, SN35. And for the person who's saying the books are his preferred way to read, and yet they're very expensive, um, you can, well, I guess you can't get, maybe you can get secondhand books. I think Gunter might know actually about that. And also, well, you have Sutta Central, it is online again. <laughs> but if, um, yeah, as I say, we won't always be doing Suttas from the Samyutta. So if you can only afford one, I don't know, but I do think Samyutta Nikaya is a wonderful one, especially for practitioners. So I'm not quite sure. Uh, so last comment here that I'll read. Time flew by so quickly and I did not notice the time at all. This was very deep and interesting. There's a lot for me to reflect on and try to notice about my own Vedana. Wonderful. About Vedana. Remember, it's not yours. <laughs> but the Vedana that you experience. <laughs> Great. Okay. Oh, Gunter, that's so kind. He's going to try and check and get oh. copies. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> mm. So let's see if Gunter can actually get hold of uh, a copy uh, or some cheap copies of sitters. We might be able to share them out. I don't know. Let's see. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's so generous. And um, yeah. It's getting nearer to the time when we burn out. Yes. Yeah, so thank you, Venerable Chanda and Venerable Upeka both for the very rich teachings uh, of Samdhita Nikaya today. And uh, you gave us the opportunity to discuss, question, and understand the teachings deep as well, not only to listen to a Dhamma talk, but to get involved and ask what exactly it means and the people's questions and improve the practice. And today's Sutta discussion was offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. With your generosity, Anukampa Bikuni project and, and the Venerables can provide the community and the wide world with all these valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, and meditation retreats. And Anukampa Bikuni project, as you know, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> is a UK charity, and we recently purchased <clears throat> we recently purchased a new property called Anukampa Grove Monastery in Oxford. It gives more space to monastics and opportunity for women to ordain and lay people to visit, etc. So your donations are very valuable in maintaining the new monastery um, with its higher upkeeps and maintenance cost as well. Um, it, and it costs to change the house to a workable monastery, as you can imagine. So I invite you to support Anukampa if you are able. What we need these days mostly is the financial support. And if you would like to support the new monastery and its Sangha's requisite, you are invited to donate. And there's a donation link in our website, and I will put the donation link here as well in the chat box. 
Thank you so much, Manoe. Uh, I'm just writing down in the chat that tomorrow there's a meta meditation with Venerable Apeka, uh, 9 a.m. UK time. She's wonderful at guided meditation. So I definitely encourage anybody who can to be there. I don't know, depending on your time zone, but it's a, a really great way to start the weekend. I'm traveling up to my parents uh, tomorrow, and so I won't be present. Um, and also, of course, people are welcome to come visit us here. We're mostly full this year um, because anyway, I'll be on rains on my annual rains retreat. But from next year, we still have places. Uh, we already have bookings also. We've actually got one guest pretty much through the whole year, like one for three months, then one for two and a half months, something like this. So we're we're doing pretty well, but uh, there's still opportunities for others as well. And there'll be other visiting monastics next year, hopefully Venerable Lepeka. She intends to come again. So fingers crossed that that will happen. Uh, and yeah, just wish you well. I can't think of anything else to add at the moment, but... I guess, yeah, please contact the team at if you'd like to get involved. That includes offering food or coming to stay or whatever else. You can volunteer if you're local. We need people to help with the garden and there's plenty of vacuuming to be done. It will help the people who stay here if we have more uh, hands on board. We also have, I mean, what I still really need, which I very rarely say, is that I do a lot of admin all day long outside of the teachings and <laughs> the engaging with visitors. So, I mean, if there would be anyone more local or anyone kind of interested in staying longer term to help with some of that or even remotely, but, you know, it needs to be a significant commitment because it wouldn't make a lot of difference otherwise. So, yeah, bit by bit, we shall manage. So thank you. I'm really, I mean, the reason I'm smiling so much, I don't know if you no noticed me smiling so much while Minori was speaking, it wasn't because I'm keen to hear her talk about Dana, it was because of your generosity, just seeing Gunther and Shirley mention about the books, it's just heartwarming. I just, you know, when I came over from Perth, I love those communities in, in Perth so much, they're like my spiritual family. I just thought if I could have even a little bit of that amount of love and kindness and generosity and gratitude in my community, I will be a happy person, you know. And I'm just, I know it's not, proud is a funny word, right, because I don't own any of you, so you're not my responsibility in that sense. I can't take credit. But what can I say? Heartwarmed, gladdened by my community, by this community, by you, that you are just so demonstrating the qualities of real buddhists you know this is how buddhists should be generous kind compassionate towards one another and supportive and i just yeah let's use the word proud for a moment that's how i feel so delighted really to have such a wonderful community and a community who you know so eager to talk about the deep dhamma uh, it's really uh very supportive for my own practice too so thank you <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, we have Ajahn Brahmali coming over very soon. There's not a lot of bookings, so if you are coming, please book so that we don't panic that the halls will be so quiet. And uh, Ajahn Brahm and myself will also be, it's not a talk, it's a, it's a retreat, a three-day retreat with Ajahn Brahm and me, and also Venerable Upeka, who we're trying to ask to give one of the talks. <laughs> so, all right. Wonderful. So take care, everybody. I will unmute you or we'll stop the recording. Uh, Gunter can stop it and we can unmute you and wave goodbye.